My name is Susan Ives. I'm with the Living New Deal, which is a project at UC Berkeley. The Living New Deal is about 12 years old, and it was founded to begin to document all of the New Deal sites around the country. Um, the roads, bridges, civic buildings, artworks. We have a website, it's livingnewdeal.org, and you'll find almost 16,000 New Deal sites that people like you have submitted um, to us and which we post and describe um, on the website. So it's a crowdsourced website. If you know of a New Deal site in your community, um, you go to our website, you don't find it there, please let us know because we'd like to post it on our, on our website. Um, tonight I, I'm here and happy to introduce the moderator of tonight's panel. Um, his name is Harvey Smith. He's an advisor to the Living New Deal. And he's also the president of the National New Deal Preservation Association, which is headquartered in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, it's, a, it's a sister organization to the Living New Deal, and it's also documenting New Deal artworks in particular, but other New Deal structures and infrastructure around the country. Um, so I'm going to just turn it over to Harvey and let him introduce tonight's panelists. Again, we're delighted that you're here. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the Living New Deal, you can find us online. We also have some New Deal maps of San Francisco and some information about the organization, which we're going to leave out for you if you're interested. So thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Um, we had a feeling it was going to be a good turnout tonight. And it has turned out that way. Um, I, I do want to mention, since we're in a union hall, uh, part of my little bio is that I'm also a former member of two teacher unions and the Carpenters Union. So solidarity with, with union members. Um, so our, our panel, uh, you've probably read in the program, but it consists of uh, Robert Cherney, Dewey Crumpler, and is Dewey, I don't see Dewey here yet, but hopefully he'll make it, um, Tamaka Bailey and Lope Yap Jr. Um, so I'm gonna make a, just a few remarks and then I'll introduce the panel as a whole. And then the, the first panelist to present will be uh, Bob Cherney, who will give you some background on the, actually the complete uh, 13 panels of the Arnotoff murals. So I want to state from the outset uh, that this is not a debate. We have deliberately not included those who wish to destroy the Arnertoff mural in this panel. This is a forum. <laughs> this is a forum to sum up where we go from the point of the school board's decision to destroy the 13 panel mural. If you are interested in the other side's position, go to the San Francisco Unified School District Board's website, and you can view over two hours of debate, pro and con, on two evenings last month. I'm not without sympathy for those who say the images in the mural are hurtful. I'm likewise sympathetic to those who are deeply upset by nudity in art, or by provocative images by an artist like Robert Maplethorpe. However, these feelings do not justify censorship. <laughs> Certainly, some images are not appropriate for children or kids, as almost all the mural detractors describe the high school students. More appropriately, the students should be referred to as adolescents, young people, or young adults. I've been a high school teacher. I know high school students to be critical thinkers, able to parse different realities. The urban youth I've taught see on the streets of their neighborhoods daily scenes that are both hurtful and violent. I'd like to provide some context for this controversy, something I found to be completely missing from the school board hearings. These murals were created through the Works Progress Administration, one of several New Deal programs that employed artists and brought art to the public. When replying to people who ask, what is the New Deal? I often flippantly describe it by saying, just think of now and then think of the opposite. <laughs> that was the New Deal. 
The New Deal was characterized by taking care of the 99%, not the 1%. Franklin D. Roosevelt articulated the New Deal's public policy directions in several key addresses. In January 1941, he spoke about the four freedoms, freedom of speech and worship, freedom from want and fear. In January 1945, he outlined his Economic Bill of Rights, stating everyone has a right to employment, education, housing, and health care. These were not platitudes. The programs of his administration strove to make them real for all Americans. Furthermore, he envisioned a United Nations that would do likewise throughout the world. After his death in 1945, the UN founding conference was held here in San Francisco. Eleanor Roosevelt carried forward in 1948 his ideals by developing the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Looking specifically at George Washington High School, built by the New Deal's Public Works Administration, we see a school designed by one of the city's most prominent architects and standing on a site that would be gobbled up quickly by a greedy private developer and city hall enablers today. A team of artists embellished the building, including an African-American Sergeant Johnson, who supervised a team of 40 assistants to create his massive relief on the football field. One of the murals was painted by a French immigrant artist, Lucien Lebeau, who would become a wartime artist and war hero when he died on a mission in South Asia. I say all this to show there was an ideological basis for the New Deal and what it produced. What is the ideological basis for those who wish to destroy a New Deal artwork, particularly one that they have grossly mischaracterized? If we were truly combating white supremacy, we would be continuing the cr critique initiated by Arnotov and instituting a defined program to get there. We have been in the same place 50 years ago. During that time, the Black Panther Party articulated a 10-point program that included employment, housing, education. The Panthers advocated for education that would teach true history. They established their own health program. Likewise, in, 19, in the 1969 Letter from Alcatraz, a cultural center, college, religious and spiritual center, museum, ecology center, and training school were proposed to advance the traditional Indian way of life. We're still waiting on all of this. The school board wants to spend roughly three quarters of a million dollars on destroying artwork while we're still lacking textbooks that tell true history. This money would also go a long way in interpreting the murals or establishing a cultural center. Those who advocate destruction of the mural do not seem to have a constructive program in mind, merely a symbolic gesture that has even been referred to as reparations. This is identi identity politics gone off the rails. What is behind trying to pit seemingly progressive allies against each other? I think most activists believe a substantial and effective strategy is needed. This is not about gestures, but about dealing with structural and institutional change. This is not about a depiction of a dead Indian on a wall, but about dead black, red, and brown youth being killed on our streets almost daily. We are living in a new Gilded Age ruled by the titans of tech. San Francisco Bay Area is the capital. Progressive people need to be collaborating together on essential issues, working together towards economic democracy. I know the line of people speaking up for the mural last month collectively included people with hundreds of years of multicultural work on social and economic justice issues. Tonight, our panel similarly represents a diverse representation of activism 
in many spheres of work. Let me introduce the panel. Robert Cherney is Professor Emeritus at San Francisco State University. He received his PhD from Columbia University. In his teaching and writing, he has specialized in U.S. history since the Civil War and the history of California and the West. He is author or co-author of 40 published essays and eight books, most recently in 2017, Victor Arnatoff and, of, of, and the Politics of Art. I highly recommend that book. Look for it. He has been a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellow, Distinguished Fulbright Lecturer at Moscow State University, Visiting Research Scholar at the University of Melbourne, and Senior Fulbright Lecturer at the University of Heidelberg. He served on the city's Landmarks Preservation Advisory Committee and is currently serving on the city's Historic Preservation Fund Committee. Dewey Crumpler, and I hope Dewey shows up, is, hmm? He's not gonna make it? Oh, okay. Dewey is not gonna make it, but uh, Dewey is an associate professor of painting at the San Francisco Art Institute. And his, I, I'm not gonna go into his uh, full bio, but it is online at the Art Institute website. And if you haven't seen the video of Dewey talking about the mural and, and protecting it, uh, you can easily found online. Tamaka Bailey is a member of the Oklahoma Choctaw Nation and a certified community teacher of the Choctaw language. He's a native born San Francisco. He's a storyteller, magician, performing artist, and a member of SAG-AFTRA, that's the Screen Actors Guild American Federation of Television and Radio Artists. He is co-founder of the nonprofit organization Linking Rings Performing Arts Group and a Jefferson Award winner. Lope Yap Jr. is a San Francisco-based film producer, director, production manager, assistant director, and special effects producer. He's a native of San Francisco, attended George Washington High School, was inducted into its Hall of Merit in 2006, and is vice president of the Alumni Association. His credits as assistant director and visual effects producer include many TV and Hollywood productions, such as The Hunt for Red October, Titanic, Farewell to Manzanar, Party of Five, Beverly Hills 90210, Just Like Heaven, Nash Bridges, and many more. He's a member of and has been honored by the Directors Guild of America. He's been a guest speaker and lecturer at many universities and colleges and schools. Um, and we, we, it, we, there's other people in this audience tonight, and I hope we can mingle a little bit at the end, that are also very qualified uh, to talk about this issue. We, we have many uh, public artists here, muralists, uh, and other folks that have been very involved in issues of getting public art out into the community and preserving it. So we're gonna open up with a, a brief uh, review of what is actually uh, in the Arnatop mural and that would be presented um, by Bob Cherney. Bob. Victor Arnatop was one of the most prolific New Deal artists in San Francisco. Uh, he was born in Russia in 1896. He uh, served as a cavalry officer in World War I, and then in one of the white armies during the Russian Civil War. He came to San Francisco in 1925 to study art at what is now the San Francisco Art Institute. Uh, when his student visa expired, he went to Mexico and spent two years as an assistant to Diego Rivera, after which he and his family came back to San Francisco in 1931. Uh, and he began to produce uh, murals, uh, born fresco murals, which is a type of, of wall painting in which the artist paints on wet plaster, which means that the paint penetrates the plaster and becomes actually a part of the wall. Uh, it, it means that the paint tends to remain very vivid, uh, and it doesn't crack in the way that oil paintings on, on canvas often crack. It also means that it's very difficult to move it. Uh, this is a list of the New Deal murals that Arnatoff did between 1933-34 at Cold Power and the last of them at South San Francisco 
uh, in the early years of World War II when these programs were beginning to be phased out. Uh, I should probably give a little plug to the Richmond, California mural. Uh, for about 10 or 20 or 30 years, it was rolled up in a box in the basement of the post office and has recently been recovered. And the Richmond Museum is in the process of, of raising funds to restore the mural so it can be displayed again. If you're at all interested in that, if you're at all interested, they're doing a fundraiser uh, in a couple of months, and you can go to their website and find out about that. Let's change now. Uh, that's George Washington High School, as Harvey said. Uh, it was built partly with a, a bond issue and partly with funds from the Public Works Administration, another new, new Deal agency to create permanent infrastructure and with extensive art through the Works Progress Administration, uh, which was to provide relief for unemployed, and, and in this case, unemployed artists. Uh, and this is Victor. It's obviously a posed picture because um, he's not dressed in his smock and he's, he's uh, pointing to something rather than painting something. But that, that's Victor and that's one of the murals. Let's go to the next one. There are 13 separate murals. The largest ones are uh, along the stairs going from the entryway up to the main hallway. And this is one of them. It's the first chronologically. Uh, it's divided here by a tree. And on one side, we have Washington's early life, including his work as a surveyor. On the other side, we have the French and Indian War which was Washington's first military experience. But I found it very interesting that instead of putting Washington in the middle of this, he put American Indians in the middle of this, sort of surrounded on all sides by the British and the French and the American colonials. This is the one opposite it. Uh, it's not as good a photograph. I apologize for that. But these are really hard to photograph because they're so enormous. This is the origins of the American Revolution. We've got the Boston Tea Party, the Boston Massacre, the burning of tax stamps. But again, in the middle, he did not put George Washington. George Washington is way up here arriving to take command of the army. But in the middle, he put four working class men raising the flag. There are six small murals in some alcoves off the upper hallway. Uh, and three of them have to deal with the American Revolution. This one shows Washington greeting Lafayette and von Steuben and the other foreign officers who had come to assist the Americans. Perhaps Arnatov's way of emphasizing that the Americans did not win this war on their own, that they had some significant help. This one is Valley Forge. And to me, this is Arnatov's comment on class privilege at the time of the American Revolution, because we have the officers over here, very warmly dressed, winter clothing, nice and warm. And here we have the enlisted men dressed in rags, with their feet wrapped in rags, uh, uh, all bandaged up. Uh, I think this is Arnatov's comment on what it was like to have been a cavalry officer, <laughs> because he comments in his memoirs about uh, the class disparities that were involved between the officer class and enlisted men. This one is the, uh, the American victory at Trenton. Uh, if you had a, an American history textbook more than 30 or 40 years ago, you may have had a picture in it of Washington crossing the Delaware. Very unrealistic picture. Uh, that's the predecessor to the Battle of Trenton, but probably the most famous depiction of it. Uh, but what Arnatov showed is enlisted men taking the surrender of one of the Hessian mercenaries. Washington isn't even in this one. It's just about enlisted men doing, doing their duty. There are then three more small panels in the alcoves off the main hall that deal with later aspects of Washington's life. This one shows Washington bidding farewell to his aged mother. 
I don't see any political implications here. This one shows Washington mediating between Jefferson and Hamilton trying to implement the new Constitution. And this one shows Washington unsuccessfully trying to found a national university. Arnatoff did a lot of research for these murals. Uh, and he said in his memoirs that he wanted to show two things. He wanted to show Washington, because that was what he was commissioned to do. It was for George Washington High School. His commission was the life of Washington. But he also wanted to show what he called the spirit of his times. And I think the next two that I'm going to show you are really Arnatov's depiction of the spirit of the times from his perspective. And his perspective at the time was that his politics had been steadily moving to the left ever since he'd worked as an assistant for Diego Rivera. Uh, he had not yet joined the Communist Party. He didn't join until 1938, and he joined secretly. Uh, so it was never public information that he was actually a member of the party. But after 1938, he did begin to associate with a lot of very left organizations, and people drew their own conclusions. Uh, including the FBI, who began surveillance of him in 1941. In his art, he called himself uh, a social realist. He also said that the artist must be a critic of his society. Uh, and Arnatov, as a social realist, thought that he should be realistic, showing people rather than abstract imagery. But he also had an obligation to be a critic. And in these next two murals, you will see his critic, criticism of those times. Here we have Mount Vernon, the Mount Vernon plantation. Once again, he does not put George Washington in the center. Of the four large murals, Washington is not in the center of any of them. He put American Indians in one. He put working class men in the other. In this one, he put enslaved African Americans. Why do you think it's important to remind everyone there are no questions now? In the mid-1930s... Not now. Not now for questions. This is a testimony. No. 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 Shame. You're a 
Thank you. Where are the Native American and Black people that were invited? The Radical leftist art. Ignorant. Destroying the degenerative art and what we do about the Jews. Did you study that history? Hate leftist art. He killed nine million Jews. He didn't like that art, so he fucking destroyed their fucking art. My family left Russia. Yeah. Because well, my yeah. Okay. Okay. But you're not answering the question. Right now. You are opposed to education. You are a censor. You I'm are a totalitarian. Why are you censoring you the words that I was speaking of Native American students directly Because you need to take your turn. Welcome to stay and listen. You are not welcome to stay and listen. Can you participate as a listener? You are welcome to do so. And you may sit here. Thank you. You're welcome. You don't want people to go out. You want them to raise their hand and participate in the meeting of their life. But understand this. If your ideas are unworthy, if they can't be defended through a rational discussion, you have to disrupt. You have to take money from the oppressor. Which agency, I don't know. Which nonprofit, I don't know. National Endowment for Democracy, maybe. But the point is, they don't have a rational argument. That is their argument to disrupt. We don't want them to leave. Okay, we see. let them hand their leaflet yeah, let's out, go didn't back. we? Let's go back and We did. Okay. Let's no go violence. Let's go back and so just understand, no, for those who might be weak and not understand what happened here, they came to disrupt. They left. Okay. We won. Thank you. One other point I'd like to, to uh, draw out is that the mural detractors have sort of taken this phony moral high ground and claim to speak for the entire Native community and for the entire Black community. We, we all know that the children no, that are no there. I'm a licensed psychologist. Okay. The trauma is real. Why don't you believe the trauma is real? Why don't you believe the trauma is real? It's real. Why don't you believe the trauma is real? Why don't you believe it? Why don't you believe? Believe the trauma is real. My daughter can't go there. Why don't you believe? Answer the question. Why don't you believe the trauma is real? I'm silent You're disrupting right the meeting. You're disrupting the meeting. You're disrupting the meeting. Okay? You're disrupting the meeting. Please be respectful. Respect the meeting. Oh my God! You want us to call the police? Is that what? No, we're not going to call the police. You should leave the meeting. I'm quiet. Get the hell out here. Get the hell out here. You came to disrupt. You came to disrupt. I came to tell you. You came to disrupt. Out! 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 For the entire Native community and for the entire Black community, we, we all know that no no community no you you need to go you need to go you need to go we did not interrupt we didn't you need to go. You want us to call the police? Is that where it is? Get the hell out of here. Get the hell out of here. You came to disrupt. You came to disrupt. I came to tell you You came to disrupt. Yeah, 
I, I don't know what you do about it. But, you know, we, we didn't disrupt them. We, we were, we've always been courteous. That's the thing. You know. Yeah. This ain't going nowhere. I yeah. think maybe the best thing is to call the cops. Yeah. Please, get the hell out. Get the hell out. You don't want to die in the house. 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 No, nobody, nobody can claim to speak for an entire community. You know, we can point to the classic split between Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. That there were splits in the Japanese American community over internment and enlistment in the U.S. Army. Pine Ridge, there was not unanimity amongst all the people there either. So no, I, don't, I don't see one group being able to voice uh, and, and take a more uh, phony moral high ground and say they're speaking for an entire community. Okay, so we, we like to continue at this point. Sorry for the disruption. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm very sorry too. I, I speak in public and I'm always willing to take questions and comments from the audience when I finish. Uh, and if people want to disagree with me, that's their right and privilege. I don't care. Uh, I, so I, I was very sorry to see this. Um, I'm almost done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, is, this is Arnatov's mural that depicts Mount Vernon. And as I was saying, he once again put Washington on the margins put enslaved African Americans in the center as his comment on the fact that as was all too often ignored in the 1930s that the very same men who signed the document saying all men are created equal also owned other people as property and for Arnatov this was clearly one of the great contradictions of Washington's time one that he depicts here by making it clear that Washington was dependent upon slave labor for his wealth. So this is one of Arnatov's major social criticisms. And this is the other one. Again, Washington is on the side. Arnatov commented upon this mural at the time. He said that in his reading, he kept looking for some way to connect Washington to the West, which of course would have been very difficult because in Washington's time, the nation ended at the Mississippi River, you know. Uh, but he found some reference to Washington at some time making a statement about the significance of the West. So he has Washington here pointing to the West and literally pointing to the West. This is on the wall so that Washington is actually pointing out at the Pacific Ocean. Uh, but in the center, again, he puts his social criticism. These pioneers depict what Arnatov at the time called, and I'm quoting him, the westward march of the white race from the Atlantic to the Pacific. That, that's his words. And of all, you've seen all the other murals are in color. 
right? But he puts these marching pioneers in a kind of ghastly grayscale. He learned this from Diego Rivera. When he worked with Rivera, he saw Rivera putting things that, that were disagreeable and ugly and, and uh, disreputable in this kind of a grayscale as a contrast to what was going on in the, in the rest of the mural that was in color. And of course, they are marching west past a dead Indian warrior. Arnatov's comment on the cost of the settlement of the west. And on this side, we have a white man and an Indian sitting down together with a peace pipe. And over their head is a broken branch. Why? Why put a broken branch over their heads? I think it's probably Arnatov's way of, of depicting broken treaties. So here we have the dispossession of the first people as well as genocide. So for Arnatov, the spirit of the times of early American history involved slavery and the killing and dispossession of Native Americans. So this is his social criticism of Washington's time. Uh, but there are, oh, this, this is just, uh, I'd forgotten I've stuck this in, so you can go to the next one. He had three ceiling murals. This one shows Liberty putting new stars onto a blue field. And two more ceiling murals, the moon, which he meant to depict war, and the sun and a rainbow, which he meant to depict peace. And I thought it was deeply ironic when Mark Sanchez, the vice president of the school board, who puts on his website that he is a second openly gay member of the school board, moved to paint out this rainbow mural during Pride Month. <laughs> and there is my shameless plug. <laughs> I was going to end with that, but I couldn't resist the cartoon that I found this week. So here we have Arnatov. These are quotes, quote, actual quotes from Arnatov. The making of art cannot leave the viewer indifferent. Its goal is to move people to stimulate their thinking. It's a weapon of ideas. I just want to point out the cartoonist, Carol Denny, <laughs> in the audience. Our uh, next panelist is Tamaka Bailey. Halito, greetings in my native language of Choctaw. Uh, it's hard for me to speak after what I just saw. Um, these are my relatives. I know where they're coming from. I know where that hatred comes from. Because I, when I get angry, it's because I think of the stories that my mom told me when she took a beating for speaking her language at the boarding schools. This is why I don't want those murals down. Because in the words of the superintendent, Mr. Cook, when he spoke at the very end before casting that vote against or to have those taken down, he said when he went in to the south and he walked into those places where those slaves were kept, he felt that anger. He was emotionally charged to stand up so that doesn't happen again. That's where I stand with these murals. These murals are showing the fact that George Washington and others we're genociding our people. If you take those murals down, what do we got? Just our speaking? That's not going to work. If, if Superintendent uh, Stephon Cook went down to the south and somebody tore those 
uh, um, places in which they stored those uh, slaves, he wouldn't have that emotional feeling the way that our people should see these murals as. You can be angry, but to be offended? No. What it should do is exactly what we just heard Professor Cherney say. And he was the one to uh, enlighten me. Because, see what happens whenever I speak or <laughs> technology goes down. But the thing is, is that uh, in those murals, I saw, if you saw that one that he showed, the slide that he showed, where those uh, settlers were in gray, yeah. the way I interpret it, that's the gray area of that administration. The area in which he's, uh, and then it, and, and listening to Dewey uh, Crumpler, Professor Crumpler, speak on KGO and bringing out, now I know that it was brought out about the broken branch. Did you notice the, the tree at the head of, that in, of the native that was lying dead on the, on, on the ground? Dewey says that's the the uh, misconception that we are taught in schools that George Washington was an honest man who did not, who told everybody he chopped down that cherry tree, which is what that represented in his mind. And I looked at that and I said, you know, there's a lot of interpretation here. But the most important thing for me as a First Nation person who is an elder who has gone to his elders to seek counsel on what they feel about this. Yes, they are angry. We are angry. But if we did not have these visual history um, pieces out there, how are we going to say it happened? When they turn around and say, no, that didn't happen. Because why else would we have our activists, our native activists out there, except that we're not being heard? And I can, I can attest to that. And I can, hear, I, I can feel the way they feel. Where, how come we're always eliminated? People say, oh, this is a nation of immigrants. What about the First Nation peoples that were here? Why don't you uh, signify that? And that's why art in, in, in those murals should be preserved. Because now we have that visual effect to show that. It's almost, and I, I shared this with uh, Lupe uh, and, and, the, and the rest of the alumni. It, to me, if you take those murals down, it would be like telling um, then General Eisenhower, don't take the pictures of those, uh, of those ca concentration camps. Don't do that. And if he didn't do that, how are you going to prove it nowadays when they are saying that never happened? This is why it's important to see that. And, and I'm sure if, they, if, if, if these activists were to look at this in a different light, and that's all I'm asking them to do. And this is why I, I feel that in, in talking to the, uh, the Board of Education, don't come at them with hate. Hate, I've learned this. I've been more married for 45 years. <laughs> if you're angry, one of you has to calm down. Because the situation that brought that anger is not going to get settled unless somebody is level-headed. And this is what I see this uh, situation here. Again. I would have to go to Stefan Cook and ask him if they had taken those shacks down. By your own admission, it got you going. Can't you see that by doing that? And then the other thing is, there was other alternatives. I remember I went to one of the alumni meetings, and Lupe was sharing a little bit about that, on putting projections up. And one of the ladies there, she showed me this a deal where when the projections are up, the murals aren't seen. Then if uh, George Washington High School, a place of education, 
wanted to teach art, all they had to do is flip the switch, the murals would come up. Then they can teach that. Turn them off. So that way nobody's offended. Then if you wanted to teach history, bring your class in. Flip the switch. Show that history. That's how I see this. Uh, and and I, that's why I ran over here to talk to Lope, because he, he had shared a little bit of, of, of that cost. If they put something up like that, it's going to be somewhere, I think he said it was a, about 150000 on up to 300000 That's 500, or that's 3,000, or 300,000 cheaper than it's going to take them to take it down. Why can't we come that come to that as a as a um, a compromise? Something to save that. Then nobody is is offended by this if you put those up. Well, a curtain. Uh, it's just it's just the idea that there's, there's other alternatives. And that's why when I just saw this, I saw people who are already set in their ways. They're not going to listen. And you cannot talk to people that way. You're not going to get anything done. And this is why I ask those people to think about how our, 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 our native people right now are getting things that they have also, including myself, have stepped up and, uh, and said, why can't we get our land back? And in just recently, in the past three, uh, three years, there has been California natives who have been given back 300 over, I should say, over 600 acres of their sacred land back because they knew how to deal with the government. And it wasn't through hate. It wasn't through disruption. It wasn't through physical violence. That's not the way to do it. And this is why I encourage you, come up with a plan. Uh, even if you have to go up to them and say, okay, I appreciate you and respect your views. But as one who is a voter, who voted you in because we felt that you were able to speak for us, I wanted to share what I felt on this. And I think that if you looked at it this way, instead of paying 600000 on up to take these down, it's, it's a waste of money, no, and I'm not an attorney, so I don't know this, but I would think that we voted to have that budget. I don't think the budget included $600,000 to take down a mural. You know, it's to educate our kids. These murals are educational. This is what we need to look at it as, as an educational part. Because I can be like you, I'm, I'm not an artist, I'm a performing artists, but I can see that some places that I want to go to because they find out that some of my um, routines, because I do magic performances as well, some of my routines include stories from the native people in which I got permission from my elders to, to share. Uh, they in turn said, oh, well, we'll have to fit you in somewhere. I says, it's still a magic performance. It's just that my routines are different than what the others are, and I tell the stories. Well, we'll still fit you in somewhere. You know, so I, I can hear, I know where they're coming from, where that anger is coming from. But we can't let that anger turn into hate and try to make decisions being hateful. That's not going to get us anywhere. And that was, that was the only thing that I can think of to share with you and to keep in my, uh, that in mind. Again, like I said, I, can, I know where they're coming from. I know that anger. But what we need to do, and, and this is something that also uh, I suggested. I think that George Washington High School, when they have uh, their, um, what do you call the orientation of new students, they should take them to those murals and explain what those murals are, what they state. And then, then those who are offended, uh, as I understand, there are some First Nation kids that are offended by that. If they are offended, then they need to hear it from their teacher and their parents. 
what those murals really do show. They don't show white supremacy. They show the nasty side of Washington's administration. And they need to be taught that. And that's where I think we dropped the ball in that respect. Nobody's teaching them what those murals are. So that's it. Uh, Lope Yap Jr. Lope uh, is involved with the Alumni Association and I think has been working pretty tirelessly on this issue. So Lope. Lope. So um, thank you for coming, by the way. It's, it's always great to hear um, people's response in a etiquette professional setting. And um, I was appointed um, last summer, early fall of 2018. Can you hear me OK? I'm, OK. Um, and there was 11 people on the Reflection and Action Group that was created by the superintendent and the uh, president um, of the school board. And I walked in thinking sort of like a jurist that we're gonna find, you know, fact find like a grand jury, if you will, and find things out. And, and at the end of the four meetings over six months, we would vote to recommend something, sorry, um, <laughs> um, to recommend back to this, uh, the board, the superintendent and president. Um, the first meeting was great. Uh, there were some people here. Sorry, sorry. It's just, um, for, the first meeting was really great. It gave a lot of information. I, I felt like I was back in college taking notes. But as the second meeting started, it started to turn where I started to feel like I'm the only one here and is, is not on the same script. And by the way, for those of you who do not know what I do for a living, I'm a I'm a person who gets paid a lot of money to create illusions for a living. So when you sit on your couch potato, you'll think that, you know, that's all real. <laughs> so I'm really good at doing that, but I'm also smart enough not to believe all those illusions. <laughs> and the last eight months or so has been challenging. Let's just put it that way. And when I say challenging, um, I heard a lot of comments in the last eight months. And I have to tell you, I, I've just shook my head for the last three weeks. I, uh, I have to tell you that it was painful as a native of San Francisco, proud to be raised in this town, know where all the dead bodies are, know all the, you know, all that stuff, to listen to two meetings at, at the board meetings, to hear stuff I just, I was, I was embarrassed. I was humiliated as a San Franciscan. I won't get into the details of this, but I just want to let you know objectively, since some of you were not at these meetings, I can honestly tell you, um, that people on the pr preservation side to protect these priceless murals, we were on point, we were professional, we didn't stray, we never ever criticized anyone, we had total empathy, we tried to stay, on, like I said, on point, and then we had to sit for 30 minutes and listen to all this stuff that I don't even want someone over 90 years old ever hear because anything under it, it just didn't make any sense to listen to this stuff. So I just want to let you know that from the second meeting to today, I was the last to figure out that this was all pre-planned. I was the last to figure out that um, I was just a character in a movie, in, in a process. And I'm just going, is this real? I can't believe I'm listening to what I'm hearing, particularly when the opposition spoke and said a lot of terrible things. And then so when it came back to the board, when public comment comments were over, the president looks at us and says, I want to thank you for all of your civility. And I looked at people around me, I go, is there a new definition of civil civility I don't know? Because I have to tell you, there's a few things that I just got to tell you. After 30 minutes watching people wearing, uh, wearing T-shirts or signs, correct? Someone said, not over my dead body, in referring to the dead Indian. Um, don't support white supremacy. Paint it down. These people are talking, same thing, right? They were, as you heard earlier, or saw earlier, a lot of things out of order. 
And this president would say, thank you for your civility. And I would go, are we crazy here? Am I not paying attention? Am I missing something? And then the last meeting, I have to tell you, this is, remember, I create illusions for a living, right? Imagery is real big. So I see this board member wearing the same black t-shirt that other people in the audience are wearing. This is an official board meeting. People are elected to supposedly lead, come over the crazy so that you can govern or administer something. This woman's wearing a t-shirt, and I'm going, I can't believe I'm watching this. This is like Rose Bader Ginsburg wearing a t-shirt over a robe kind of a thing. <laughs> and, and she's wearing this shirt that says, paint it down, or something to that effect. And then they put it on their Facebook, like they're really like, take it over the top already. I go, oh my god, this is crazy. And then they decide to do this thing called a unanimous vote. And I said, you're all going to go down because if you didn't, um, you would be separate and divided, right? But they could harness their energy by really going down to the new nadir of San Francisco politics. And I'm saying, you know, this has been, we're going down in deeper uncharted waters here. I just never have seen this. And um, I was quite more amazed when these commissioners were doubling or tripling down from the responses or the commentary from the public, saying things like, those who want to preserve these murals are here to support white supremacy. And then the best one, the best one was right after that, they said, and those people of color who want to preserve these murals, they've been colonialized. So I kind of like did my thing. I just said humble. I didn't say anything. But then I was thinking about my, my new gang of four stooges. The president of the George Washington High School Alumni Association is a Jewish man who, who has spoke on behalf of the Holocaust victims as long as I've been living. There is a man named Dewey Crumpler. He's like my brother from another mother who <laughs> I don't know what white supremacy blood he has in him. I just can't. And this guy, Tamaka, I don't know, man. I mean, and then there's me. And there's me, like, who says, you know, I know a lot about things. And I want to share these with you so you can appreciate how personally and professionally I felt upset and happy at the same time. Because I knew that when this came out, my family and friends would start laughing at me. They'd go, man, I didn't know you were a white supremacist, Loki. <laughs> And, and my daughter said, you are a white supremacist? So let me just tell you three things where maybe that is like just BS. So earlier you heard the word or the, or the name of a movie called Farewell to Manzanar. And as I speak today, there's an exhibit in the Presidio. And at the board meeting, I made one reference to a line in the exhibit where it said the trust and the Japanese community and the people who were interned, and the descendants of the people who were interned, that they have this exhibit so that we would never effing do this again. I'm, I'm using my F, but you, know, but you get what I'm saying, right? All right. So I made, with John Cordy, farewell to Manzanar. I, you have to understand, my family's from the Philippines. My father was a retired Navy guy, went back to the Philippines in 1938, had my I got married to my mother, had, a, had, his, had my older brother, my older sister. My dad had tattoos like, I love John Wayne and apple pie. <laughs> and this small little thing came out called World War II, right? My father marches down to a dock and tells the captain of the Navy, he says, hey, you got to get us out of here. All those crazy Japanese people are going to get us. And they said he wouldn't take my mom because she wasn't naturalized. So my dad takes the family, they go back, and my dad goes fights another war because he didn't, also didn't want my mom and sister and brother to be associated with them. So when I made Farewell to Manzanar, my dad accused me of being an idiot because he said, if they won, you wouldn't be here. And I said, Dad, but you got to like learn from history. You can't like, you know what I'm saying? It's kind of like hard to tell my father, who was at that time in his 70s, that I'm making a movie about people who try to, you know, the, that ancestry in the Philippines was going to try to kill him. And I'm in the United States, the firstborn in my family, trying to say, yeah, but 
you got to separate this stuff. You know, that was then, this is now, et cetera, et cetera. Now, do you remember in um, the 90s, there was a, an African-American man in Texas named Charles Byrd, and he was beaten, dragged, and murdered? So this is my answer to the uh, white supremacist accusers. I was hired to produce a 30-second public ad. And it was the re recreation of Mr. Bird. It was the most painful thing I've ever done. You never saw the body. But remember, I make illusions for a living, and I do it well. And um, we did it. And all these big, burly highway patrolmen were with me. They couldn't stand watching this because they knew what was happening at the end of the chain. So the, the 30 second um, ad basically, you see the reaction, uh, the remake, and the voiceover is from the daughter. And she says something, something like, my, my father was beaten, dragged, and murdered just because he was black. And now I'm feeling I'm getting beaten, dragged again because Governor Bush won't sign this anti-hate legislation. Please call 555, five, 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 you know, all that stuff. And then if you remember, this was in the uh, Bush-Gore campaign in late 1999. And the former congressman, I believe his name was a Fume, and he was from Maryland. They had this press conference on a Thursday. And after they showed this, for the next 52 weekends on all the speaking shows, all the right were saying, we have to get the tax exempt status away from the NAACP because they're making political ads. And at the same time, I'm saying to my friends, can, for Christmas, can you guys give me Kevlar? Because if ever, anyone ever knew who really made this, <laughs> this would not be good. Because I had a lot of people who weren't necessarily happy with that end result. So I take, I, I kind of like was wondering on that last meeting. I'm going, they call me a white supremacist, man. I mean, you know, some of my best friends are black. I like to say that, guys. Some of my best friends are black because I have family members who are Grenada, and I've got Korean. I mean, I've been mistaken for almost every race you could ever imagine, including Italian, by the way. And, but no one's ever accused me of being a white supremacist. So that's why I thought, is this a comedy show? Because it just, it just doesn't ring, you know? So I have to tell you that, uh, as, as you heard earlier, I'm, I'm vice president of the George Washington High School Alumni Association. I, um, I'm a proud, proud alum. And um, I have to tell you, even though this has been very painful for me for the last few months, there's been great joy because there are people that I've met on this journey. People I've never met before, they just come out and just thank all of us. They thank me because I'm the only person who was the lone dissenter, if you, if you know that. Now, that's a good thing. I got to tell you, this is kind of crazy. I was the only one in the last meeting that tried to say, hey, let's try to find some proactive answers. How about if there's 13 murals of question? Why don't we figure out, try to get money to get like 60 murals total? So this would be like 20 or 25 percent or something like that. And have them traditional murals, just traditional. Get higher African American, higher First Nation artists, just like the PWA. And let's put them all through this incredible campus that has nothing but priceless art everywhere. Then I said, you know, we should put plaques all over so we can explain why there are differences. And then we should have like an annual or biannual all day assembly where people from New Deal, art, whatever, that they could come and speak to the students. And I'm, I have a promise, we're gonna do this this fall at George Washington. Um, And, and this, is, this is in addition, I mean, we really wanted to do this before, but I really want to do this now. Because I really feel that's really weird because there's been many retired teachers, administrators, counselors that I've met. Almost all of them have always said these were teaching moments. They would bring their students. They would talk in the hallway. One counselor said, you know, I was there for 35 years. I didn't hear one person ever, ever upset looking at these murals. I was actually kind of, I thought they were kind of cool. You know, you have to remember, this is the 60s. And you know, unless we were smoking dope or going to the beach go surfing, they, they kind of like say, hey, this is why we get to do this stuff. Because, you know, right? I mean, that's the way we looked at it. You know? I mean, these are my friends. <laughs> and some of my, quote, white friends never even saw them that much because they always entered from the other side of the, uh, the building. 
And I go, wait a minute, you've never seen these things? You know, it's like, oh my God. So it's kind of funny that we all come to this because they realize maybe they didn't pay attention to it, but they honored the work. They honored what it meant. You know, and um, I have to tell you, this, this thing has just gotten to me. I, I have, I, I like having a, a renaissance with Dewey because I've been seeing him a lot. And I have to tell you, there's two or three stories that most people haven't heard. Dewey's shared a lot. He, he, by the way, he apologizes. He, he thought it was another day. <laughs> and um, I'm going to have to school him on dates, you know. But, um, but the three things I really want to tell you about Dewey. Dewey, he's a great man. And when I found out through these four meetings that it felt sort of slanted and not accurate, I said, well, you know, this is really great. There's a couple of people here who are upset about this and upset about that and the history of this and everything. I said, but where are the other people? I started thinking, like, who's not here? Right? Who's not on the panel or who's not speaking to us? I find out after these four meetings, after it was recommended that you should call that living artist named Dewey Crumpler to speak on, your beha on, on the behalf of these murals, to find out they never contacted. Never contacted. Then, if you think about it, did anyone reach out to the Arnotoff descendants? Right? Just think about it. You're trying to find objective information, and you're only hearing one side. And by the way, that one side, by the third meeting, they were saying things like, don't worry about it, man. This is, this is, all, this is done. We're going to have this done by September. I go, what are you talking about? How can you say that? I mean, and yet, and then they said, oh, yeah, this is like the first of many on the agenda, you know, like changing names. And I said, oh, yeah, like changing street names, changing the name of Washington, uh, the state of Washington, changing currency, change the name of the Capitol, bu uh, Capitol. Let's go to the rotunda in the Capitol building and, you know, paint those Washington murals in the Capitol building. And, and so it's kind of crazy if you think about it, right? So when I found Tony Dewey, we had, we had many hours together, I have to tell you. We, it was quite joyful listening, talking to him. But the three things I need to share with you is when he was a, an undergrad and he was considered maybe being the, getting this commission, Dewey said his father worked for Pan Am. And when he had an inkling he might be one of the candidates, he got, you know, he got to travel for free. So he went to Mexico. He, he immersed himself with all the Diego Rivera people. He went to museums. He went everywhere, so by the time he came back and they were going to grill him about how much money he wanted, and he was just like, he did the Evelyn Wood, I'm an expert in murals kind of a thing, you know? And, and um, so then he got kind of concerned that maybe this was a token deal, and he didn't want to be involved in a token deal. So then he made this deal with um, Saul Mathis, um, the principal, the Black Student Union, and the school district. Or, and his deal was, hey, I need this much money. It's going to take a long time. And I want a deal that you'll never touch my murals or Arnotov's. And the reason for it is because, if you remember, his work was a response to the demonstrations, the uh, rioting, and the vandalism in the late 60s. And um, he wanted to make sure that no one would ever touch his murals, because his was not going to be frescoes, right? All right? So they agreed. And then I said, Dewey, where's the, where's, the, where's the compact? Where's the contract? He goes, man, we moved three times. I can't find it. Oh, no. So, but he said, he said he would write an affidavit. He would do that for me. I said, great. Then he said, I got to tell you something that's really, I think you'll all appreciate this story. Dewey, it took Dewey almost five plus years to make these three murals. And on the unveiling in 1974, before the ceremony was starting, going to start, Dewey, Dewey was approached by two or three, three or four former students, alums now. They're six years out of school, five years out of school. And they walked up to him and said, can we talk to you for a minute? And he goes, oh, yeah. And he was thinking, you know, like, thank you, thank you, and all that stuff. They said, listen. We've been thinking about it. We, we want to apologize to you and to Arnatov. And he goes, really? He goes, yeah. He goes, if we knew then what we learned from you now, we probably would have done it a lot differently. Because they had learned. Because he spoke to them. He educated them about why you do certain things. And that 
to him, he said, well, man, it took six years to teach somebody this. And, um, and if he was here, he'd probably tell you the same story. Um, I don't have an adapter, but I have the video that I directed with Dewey. It's very powerful. It's, and so is Tamaka's, by the way. If you ever go on YouTube, look at both of them. We, they're, they're just really, they, they, they work, talk from their heart. I mean, it's, it's just kind of amazing that we all bonded together as a result of this. Um, and, the, and, the, and the thing that really saddens me about all this, all this energy, I mean, I can't tell you. I've, I have a life. You know, I have a daughter and a wife. I, I'm trying to get this movie to, to produce and direct as I speak. And I've got some other projects that take me out of the country. I do that between 1 and 3 in the morning, I mean, because of the time zone. But um, I just wish we could have been more proactive from both sides. I, I, I personally would never touch these murals at ever. I mean, I wouldn't even be happy with the, a curtain and, and whatever. But if that, if that was going to appease people or whatever, I would do it. But I now know that based on how they voted, based on the commentaries I've seen or heard, um, these people are very extreme. So anything other than completely destroying this wonderful work of art, priceless uh, art, their, their concern is if they permanently put latex or plywood or something, that one day, guess what? Another board might be voted in and say, you know what? Those people in 19, uh, 2019, they made an error. Let's take them back. Let's take them off. Let's see these. And that's something they don't want to do. That's what saddens me. Because in honor to, now you remember, I make a living creating illusions. I love art. I, I, I could never imagine me ever saying, yeah, let's do some censorship. Let's burn those books. Let's, you know, it just, it's not in my heart. I just couldn't do it. It's, it's too painful because I know what it takes to be an artist. I, I know what it takes to do something like that manually, technically. I also know how, to, how much it costs physically, emotionally. And because my, my work is right and left brain, you know, I've got to always figure out that's really great, but can we do it cheaper? Or can, can we, you know, it's like, it's nutty time. I have to change heads all the time doing this. And, and every time I walk by these murals, I kind of go, oh my gosh. And then I, I, I have to say this thing. And then I, my friend, so does everybody know what AR, VR, IR is? It's augmented reality, virtual reality. All right. So, Virtual reality, you can almost like put on glasses or a helmet or be in a room that's basically one big helmet, and you can do something with the illusion of being in China. Or if you're a doctor in San Francisco, you could be a surgeon in another country, and the patient's in the other country. So I was thinking, oh my gosh, what if we get, you know, we get like 500 glasses and we say, okay, put these on as you walk, and then you would see like Lincoln telling Washington to F off or something. You know, or something like that, you know, like, or, or Hamilton, you know, like the old Hamilton thing. Just put on these glasses and these mural pieces come to life, you know, with these glasses. So, I guess I, I should get the hook and go. No, but... <laughs> okay. Um, I, I know that on the Alumni Association website, there is yeah. a little fundraising button. Yeah. So, what, are there plans? Yeah. Uh, so, on, on the pragmatic and the uh, real world, um, we strategize on a lot of things. And I can't get into it too deeply because of time and because we're still doing things. But um, just know that we are gr aggressively pursuing political, legal options. And um, <laughs> thank you. And I must tell you, the, the wonderful thing about this is that we have support everywhere. We are being observed everywhere. My biggest concern is the people from this little microbial part of the left has given people from the right, they make them starting to look good because they're starting to take the talking points and working against us. No, no. So, 
No, 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 it's, it's true. We have letters from Russia. I, I've been interviewed in German television. Um, so I have a piece of paper. I'm just going to be real brief. We have a political action committee. I can't tell you what we're doing, but no, it's proactive. Um, but I, what I can tell you now, I, I can say this real easily, that please remember these six or seven names that did the unanimous vote, because so there will be a time when you're going to see those names. Find that candidate who speaks 180 from them and vote for them. These people do not deserve to be <laughs> representing them. They don't. They don't. You know, I'm all for disagreeing with respect and courtesy, but that was not given to us. So um, when I'm done, I'll pass this out. Um, the Political Action Committee, um, it's called Coalition to preserve public art. Or, I'm sorry, protect. Sorry, sorry. That's my other attorney type. Uh, uh, John, sorry. There you go. And then the other part is, uh, and that's a non-tax uh, non deductible kind of donation. It's a political thing. And if you still want to support the George Washington High School Alumni Association, because we're still going to be burning up a lot of money, that you can deduct on your taxes if that's important to you. In any case, what I really love to do is to be able to eventually publicize organizations, individuals on the public action side to show the diversity of people interested in protecting and preserving um, the murals. Thank you very much. Uh, We've got about 10 minutes because I know the, the Union Hall will probably want to shut down at 9. So, yeah, okay. So, Steve, did you, do you have a comment? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so, I'm, my name is Steve Zelser, and I'm one of the organizers of Labor Fest and, uh, that has helped put this on. And one, one of the things that we uh, wanted to do when we formed Labor Fest in 1994 is to institutionalize the history of the working class in San Francisco, including the San Francisco general strike, because most people do not know about the general strike in San Francisco. That's why we form Labor Fest. And of course, part of that history is the murals that were being done in San Francisco during the general strike at Coit Tower, when Victor Arnotoff was working on them. And he was hounded by the police, by the FBI, really driven out of the United States by the anti-communist witch hunt. And you have to say, I want to thank the people who have really brought back Victor Arnenthoff, because the action of these people attacking these murals and calling them to be destroyed have made Victor Arnenthoff alive again. <laughs> who would know about these murals? Who would know about Victor Arnenthoff? So this is an opportunity for education. The other thing is I want to say is the superintendent knew exactly what he was doing. Now, when these murals were put up, they didn't put signage on them. You have to ask, why wasn't there signage on these murals? Because they were done by the most famous muralist in Northern California. Well, one of the reasons there was not signage is if they had signage on it, Nixon and the anti communists would have said, remove the murals. This is what they're about. They're attacking American history, their version of American history. That's why the murals did not have signage. What is really negligent is when the Superintendent Matthews said that he came and saw these murals a year ago. Now, he is a native of San Francisco. He didn't know about the murals, but he came and looked at them a year before, and he was shocked by them. He was shocked by how bad they were, how racist, how supremacist they were. Now, you have to ask yourself, if he was shocked by these murals, why didn't he put signage up explaining what they were? So people would understand what they were. There's no signage, and they haven't sought in an organized way to educate people. There should be a requirement every student in the San Francisco Unified School District come to Washington High and learn about these murals. <laughs> have a class. And we support a Native American cultural historical center at Washington High that can have regular classes about the history of these murals and the history of Native Americans, which we need to understand and support. That's something $800,000 should go for. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Uh, you want to take some questions, but before that, just a quick uh, 
few details about the fundraiser that Bob Cherney talked about for the Arnotoff mural in Richmond. Hello, my name is Samantha Levins, and um, I'm actually a member of the ILWU, and I'm also a Museum Studies Master student as, at SF State. And um, I'm working with the Richmond Museum of History to help preserve another Arnotoff mural called Richmond Industrial City. And this is the mural that Cherney talked about earlier, um, which has been rolled up in a basement for the last 40 years, and it is our goal to get that mural back up on the wall. And so we're going to be having a gala and a fundraiser on uh, September 12th. And so if you're interested in supporting that event, it's gonna be a major fundraiser and we're looking for organizations to sponsor this mural. So if you can go to the Richmond Museum of History website, and you can also talk to me afterwards if your organization would like to donate money to help preserve this mural. And you know, the amount of money that it's gonna to take to destroy this mural, it's gonna take a fraction of that cost to preserve this mural. So you know, if you can take $100,000 to preserve this mural, that'll probably get the job done. So we, we really hope to have all of your support and thank you very much.